when we talk about current events in the Middle East today, we are going to be talking about the battle for Jerusalem. The battle for Jerusalem that began on the 7th of October last year. And really, this is a huge turning point for our world. But first of all, I'd like us to uh, uh, watch a, about a two-minute video, which is really a, a beautiful video and quite inspiring. And I'd be thankful to our loving God in heaven that we've been able to witness these things. Well, some of us here have witnessed it uh, uh, since 1948. Probably a few, any? Many? Yeah? <laughs> I was going to say I was there, but I don't actually remember. Uh, but the marvellous things, of course, and what a beautiful miracle it is, and what a wonderful a picture there is there of this marvellous work of God with his nation of Israel. But what a struggle it has been. And uh, nevertheless, God is looking after his people. He that scattered Israel will gather him and keep him as a shepherd does his flock. And uh, dear brother Thomas saw all these things well in advance, as we know, a hundred years, in fact, before the nation became uh, such in 1848. Uh, our brother Thomas saw all these things happening and gave all our brothers and sisters in those days hope. And we're seeing it all now. It's actually happening before our eyes. For the Lord hath redeemed Jacob and ransomed him from the hand of him that was stronger than he. Well, all this, of course, is preparatory to the return of our Lord Jesus Christ 
And I'm sure we're all very confident that that day is not far away. And I think we're going to give you some very good reasons this afternoon as to why we can be absolutely confident that we are in this very last time before our Lord will be here. And it won't be long after that that he will say, I was wounded in the house of my friends. There will come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant, the promise that will never be uh, retracted, the wonderful promise of the future of Israel and the Lord reigning from Jerusalem and us, we pray, there with him in that marvellous day. Well, the day the world changed, I think we could probably even say the way the world, the day the world has changed forever. This is a remarkable turning point, and I think we'll see that as we look more de- in more detail this afternoon about the way the scripture has foreshadowed these events and where they're heading and why we are now, I surely believe the scripture is telling us, beyond the time of the end. That's an interesting thing, isn't it? It's an interesting thing to say. Beyond the time of the end to a time that the Bible calls the end of the days or the end of the world. Because the things that are happening in our world today are precisely predicted in those terms in the scriptures we shall see this afternoon. So what a terrible, terrible thing it was. Uh, horrendous what took place on that particular day. And, of course, the name given to the project by Hamas, the terrorist, was Operation Al Aqsa Flood. The reason being that everything is centred upon Jerusalem. The Al Aqsa Mosque on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. That's what they named this project, this terrorist project, uh, after. So that's exactly what we're going to be looking at. The terrorists are concerned about the future of Jerusalem, as is Israel, and as is Almighty God. So after that day, of course, we know what the terrible thing, reaction of our world. Wild celebrations took place in the streets of of Gaza, supporting what Hamas had done, and all around the world. Most terrible, I think, really, was what happened in Sydney. And, of course, in other cities around the world. And uh, terrorists, male and female, you can see there, uh, one handling a gun. All All these people so supportive of what Hamas had done, and still so. Operation Alexa Flood is a fulfilment of Zechariah 12 and verse 3. These are the times that we're in. And so you can see there on the map where uh, uh, the al Mosque is and the Dome of the Rock there on the compound on the Temple Mount, the Western Wailing Wall of uh, the people of Israel on the left-hand side there. And uh, this is the Temple Mount, or according to uh, the Arab peoples, Al-Haram al-Sharif. In that day I'll make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people all around the world. All that burn themselves with it will be cut in pieces, though, notice this, all the people of the earth are going to be affected by it, and so it was. And you can look here and see, uh, still going on, uh, these uh, protests happening all around the world there, uh, in cities like uh, London, New York, and there, of course, is Washington, outside the very White House. And on the map, you can see, with all the orange spots everywhere, that within days, protests began to erupt all around the world. Weren't only in Russia or China, by the way. <laughs> they don't allow protests like that. But everywhere in our uh, woke world, people are allowed to protest. And uh, in, in sometimes very, very violent ways. Look at the cities in Australia. I think even Melbourne's there. Yeah, Adelaide, Sydney, and uh, further north and uh, east and west. So every country, all peoples of the earth, have been affected by what's happened on that day. Every country is affected. <laughs> and here is the uh, electorate office of our own Prime Minister in Australia. They're in Marigold in Sydney. There's his electorate office, and, and what he can't get into it. For the last six or seven months, he hasn't been able to go to his office because it's blockaded. It's blockaded by the, the Palestinians and Gaza supporters, and the staff are having trouble getting in there. And, uh, the weakness of the West leaders, in particular, uh, is incredible. Uh, so far as the Prime Minister is concerned, look, 
people don't know what to do or how to handle the situation because of freedoms that have been given to people to be able to do these kinds of protests and how do you rail against it if you're not strong enough politically to do so? Or if you're reliant upon votes from people who are supportive of Hamas and the Palestinians? I mean, it's absolutely crazy that the Australian Prime Minister has allowed this to happen. But it's happening in other parts of the world as well. So the Middle East tensions are, have, actually have come to boiling point. And acts of terror are on the rise all around the world, largely as a result and beginning on the 7th of October. The terror threat in Australia was only two weeks ago was raised to probable. Australia's security environment is degrading. It is more volatile and more unpredictable. While the threats to our way of life remain elevated, we are seeing an increase in extremism. More Australians are being radicalised and radicalised more quickly. More Australians are embracing a more diverse range of extreme ideologies and more Australians are willing to use violence to advance their cause. Anti-authority beliefs are growing. Trust in institutions is eroding. Provocative inflammatory behaviours are being normalised. ASIO anticipates an increase in politically motivated violence, including terrorism. An escalation of the conflict in the Middle East, particularly in southern Lebanon, would inflict further strain, aggravating tensions and potentially fueling grievances. So there's the head of Australia's ASIO telling us that terrorism is on the rise, more and more uh, conflict is likely to happen within Australia, uh, more likelihood of uh, terrorism acts taking place, largely because of the Middle East. That's what he said, wasn't it? Largely because of the Middle East. And particularly if the battle takes uh, place in, in Lebanon, of course we have such a large Lebanese community in Australia, and so it's likely to uh, increase the, the uh, threats uh, to a large degree. Now, we're going to have a look at uh, Joel chapter 3 in some detail towards the end of this talk. But there's no shadow of a doubt that we are in a time when these prophecies are being fulfilled regarding what's happening in the battle between Israel and the Palestinians and the coming battles, well, they're already in conflict with uh, in Lebanon with the Hezbollah, but that's going to increase as well. And Joel chapter 3 gives us the answer of what's going to happen in the short term leading up to Armageddon. So just quoting a couple of thoughts from Joel chapter 3, which we will turn to in due course. What have you got to do with me, says God, O Tyre and Zidon and all the coasts of Palestine? Now, Joel chapter 3 is the only time in the Bible you will read the word Palestine, the name Palestine. It's the only time it appears in Joel chapter 3. And we're talking about the things that are happening right now to the Palestinians in this chapter. Uh, Tyre and Zidon, of course, has, the, uh, has to do with the Hezbollah, who are in the area of southern Lebanon, where Tyre and Zidon are. I will sell your sons and your daughters in the hand of the children of Judah, and they shall sell them to the civilians. This is interesting. This is what the Bible is telling us, and we can see it all starting to play out before us <coughs> right now. Now, back in September and October last year, the Palestinians were increasingly fearing that they were being marginalised because there was the potential of a peace deal between Saudi Arabia and Israel. And so they thought it's high time to, to prove our relevance. But all they showed, as we know, brothers, this is the young people, is this terrible cruelty and savagery uh, that took place and is still taking place uh, with hostages and so on in that area. It's a dreadful scene and a dreadful situation. Now, here is a brief video uh, about events that happened in September uh, leading up to the attack in October. And we'll see here an interview very briefly with uh, Mohammed bin Salman, MBS of Saudi Arabia, and also some words from uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, the Prime Minister at the United Nations. There's no question. The Abraham Accords 
heralded the dawn of a new age of peace. But I believe that we are at the cusp of an even more dramatic breakthrough, an historic peace between Israel and Saudi Arabia. But I also believe that we must not give the Palestinians a veto over new peace treaties with Arab states. What would it take for you to agree to normalize relations with Israel? Uh, for us, the Palestinian issue is very important. We need to solve that part. And we have a good negotiation. It's continue. Till now, we're going to see where it will go. We hope that it will reach a place that it will uh, ease the life of the Palestinians and uh, get Israel back uh, as a player in the Middle, uh, Middle East. So you think, if you were to characterize it, are you close? Every day we get closer. Are you So here's the timeline leading up to October the 7th. On the 20th of September, MBS, Mohammed bin Salman says to that uh, uh, reporter from Fox News in that interview, uh, every day we get closer to an agreement with Israel. 22nd of September, Netanyahu was at the United Nations and he said, we're on the cusp of a peace deal. Then came from the 24th of September, uh, the Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, because this is, of course, it last year in 2023. The dates changed, but that was the Day of Atonement last year. And then from the 29th of September to the 6th of October, the Feast of Sukkoth, that is the Feast of Tabernacles. And then the day after the Feast of Tabernacles is a feast that we might have heard a lot about, but this is it. It's a, uh, it's a day of rejoicing called Simchat Torah, which begins the new Torah annual reading cycle. So it's a day of celebration when the uh, Torah concludes, of course, that's the first five books of the Bible, uh, the last two chapters of Deuteronomy, and begins again with the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 1. There's no work on that day. Uh, the Torah scrolls are paraded through the streets. There's joy, there's much dancing. Uh, and, of course, uh, those who, who aren't necessarily religious, secular people also have their dancing, and that's what happened down there. Uh, Gaza, of course, on that particular day. But the, uh, uh, the Palestinians knew this because they were associating with the Jewish people. They knew that this would be a day when no one would be, no one would be working and they would be kind of more relaxed. And that's the day they chose. So on that day, Israel was celebrating or due to celebrate. Uh, part of the day, of course, uh, the celebrations were already happening. Uh, this Simchat Torah, which means the joy of God's word. It's a wonderful day when they read the last part of Deuteronomy and the first part of Genesis once again. They, all around the world, they celebrate this completion of their readings and the beginning of the new. And in the Holy Land, they march down the streets uh, traditionally in song and dance. That's what they are all doing the evening before because it starts, as we know, the day starts over there at sundown. And by the time dawn came, uh, they were under this terrible attack on October the 7th. This is what they read, part of what they read. You don't only chapter 33 and the early verses. Uh, this is the blessing wherewith Moses, the man of God, blessed the children of Israel before his death, and he said, Yahweh came from Sinai and rose up from Seir unto them, shined forth from Mount Paran. He came with ten thousands of his saints, so this is their celebration of the law. From his right hand went a fiery law for them. He loved the people, all the saints in his hand. Everyone shall receive of thy words. Moses commanded us a law, even the inheritance of the congregation of Jacob. That's the beginning of Deuteronomy 33 that they read on that day. Then there are the blessings of the various tribes. In Deuteronomy 3, 33, it's different to Deuteronomy 28, where there are blessings and cursings. There are just blessings for each of the 12 tribes. And then they come to the conclusion of the chapter, and the conclusion of the chapter goes like this. The eternal God is thy refuge, underneath are the everlasting arms. He shall thrust out the enemy from before thee and say, destroy them. Happy art thou, O Israel, who is like to thee, O people saved by the Lord, the shield of thy help, and who is the sword of thy excellency? And thy enemy shall be found lies unto thee and shall tread upon their high places. I think there's a reason why, I think there's a reason why uh, Israel responded to our acts of flood 
with the title of their operation, Operation Swords of Steel, Swords of Iron, Swords of Steel, depending on uh, how the Hebrew is translated. But most of them call it the Operation Swords of Steel, the sword of my excellency. They, of course, believe that God is with them in this operation against the uh, Palestinians. So the same day then, on the same day, there's a new beginning. They read Genesis chapter 1 through to chapter 2, verse 3. In the beginning, God. It's a new beginning for them. And I think really, brothers and sisters and young people, this was a new beginning, the 7th of October. It's the beginning of a new era. And nothing's going to go backwards from here. It's all going to go forwards. It's a new era for Israel and their situation. But on that morning, uh, around about half past six, 17 hours of the absolute unimaginable horror, absolutely horrendous. Uh, you, you, we can't talk about it. It was just so horrific what took place at that particular time to the people of God. Look at that family there. I mean, it's, it, your heart goes out to these people. And we still don't know what's happened to that family and those little children. The cruelty, the, the injustice, the, uh, I, I can't describe what goes through the minds of human beings that they could do something like that and take those people and hold them for that huge length of time. Then, of course, uh, you can go today to the site of the Nova Music Festival. As you said, that was sort of a secular dancing on this day, of dancing and celebration. And hundreds of people, of course, were slaughtered in that situation there. Here's another situation. You may have seen the uh, photograph or even the movie of uh, this young lady, Noah Agamani, who was taken away on a motorbike and you see the terror on her face. And uh, we uh, discovered over a period of time that uh, she was actually the, uh, uh, a Chinese Israeli. Her mother was Chinese, uh, a Chinese immigrant, and she had cancer. And she was dying of cancer. And she pleaded in a, in a video uh, around about December, January, uh, to uh, do something so that her daughter could be returned and she could see her just one last time. Well, I think the government and the army all took note of that and tried very hard to find Noah. They found her. They found three other hostages just in an apartment nearby. And the four of them were rescued in a very, very daring operation uh, at, uh, at the same time. And, uh, and so Noah met her father, as you can see at the bottom there, and was able to spend some time with her mother who was dying and she died. The mother died just three weeks later. Uh, in a way, terrible, terrible story, but, but an uplifting end, in a sense, because the uh, people of Israel knew the urgency of that situation, and the army and uh, the politicians worked very hard to get those hostages home. It was quite an operation. And I, I think you can see now uh, how Benjamin Netanyahu is a kind of a father of the nation. He really does have a, a, a care for his people. And uh, just going to have a look at this uh, video of, of the meeting. Now, this is this is quite moving, and it's a fairly quiet video. But here in Netanyahu meeting those four hostages, including Noah. Yes, 
I cannot imagine another leader who would have such a feeling for his people. I really can't. Netanyahu is a man who has been raised up by God for this time. He is a man of destiny, a man of the moment. Uh, how many have uh, read the book, Be My Story? <laughs> it's a, it's an absolutely amazing book. Uh, it was uh, published just before he uh, uh, took uh, the prime ministership role again just recently. And uh, it, it's it's the story of his life and the story of all the background and everything that led up to show he was a man who was prepared by God for the role that he has to play in these days. Not a shadow of a doubt. The Lord <coughs> looks over his people. He raises up and he puts down rulers. We know that. He is in control. And this is the man that was needed at this point in time. He's born uh, just after the Holocaust, uh, 1949, uh, at the dawn of Israel's independence. His family uh, had been involved in the Zionist movement from the turn of the last century. Uh, his uh, father uh, was a professor of history and actually wrote uh, a Jewish encyclopedia. He had huge connections, a very well-educated man, a very wise man, and with great connections, uh, of course, lived most of their time in Jerusalem, some of their time in the United States, and therefore uh, Bibi could be uh, educated in the United States uh, very well so he can communicate. Uh, he's raised up for the purpose. Not only that, he knows the terror of hostages. He himself was involved in rescuing some hostages in Lebanon uh, and, and uh, was wounded at the same time. Uh, his own brother led the Antibi raid to rescue hostages there and was killed. Uh, he has a feeling for his people. He's raised up, as uh, the book says, it's an unthinking account of a life, a family and a nation. This autobiography will stand as a defining testament to the value of political conviction and personal courage. And if you get, manage to get hold of this book, you won't be able to put it down. I couldn't put it down except that. It's more than 700 pages long, and you've got to put it down sometimes. <laughs> but it's a wonderful read, and it's a beautiful history of the people of Israel through the eyes of this man. Of course, it's personally written uh, by him, and perhaps uh, he puts a little shine on some things, but really I think it's an honest expression of his rise, the background to it, and where the nation is headed and where he wants to take it. Um, Another story. Now, what about this man? What about this man? 13th of July, not that long ago. He calls and says, I was saved by God. Do we believe that? Well, if God, if God says through Daniel, I, he removes kings and he sets up kings, this certainly is a man who again has been raised up by God. Uh, that doesn't mean to say he's not false, but he was raised up by God, particularly to support the people of Israel. And there's been no other leader. He claims it himself, and I think it's true, looking at history, no other American leader who's been so supportive of the Jewish people. Now, we know, uh, of course, that uh, he escaped the assassination attempt. Uh, there are, of course, uh, the two Kennedys who were assassinated. Uh, there were attempted assassinations there on Gerald Ford, uh, a couple of uh, attempts to shoot him. Uh, Reagan was actually shot. Uh, 2005, George uh, Bush escaped uh, a hand grenade that was thrown at him, uh, and of course, Donald Trump. Now, what the question is, is, are assassinations on the rise? Well, this article says they think they are. The political heavens are being shaken. And we know from the scriptures, uh, Isaiah 24, which has taken over into the uh, Olivet Prophecy, that the stars will fall. The heavens will be shaken. And uh, that's the sort of thing that we're starting to see. This article says they think there are going to be more assassinations. More people are going to be taken down from their leadership role, which creates instability, of course, everywhere. Um, a broader global pattern of increasing threats and violence against politicians. We seem to be seeing more assassinations on the rise now. 
And, and so it is that uh, this, uh, these last days, there will be more trouble in the political heavens. These are our times. Now, he was, he escaped. Has God got a purpose for him? He was asked that question, what do you think, you know, uh, if you believe that God uh, uh, did uh, rescue you from this that situation, why? He said, I, I really don't know. I, I think God was behind it. He said, maybe I meant to save the world. Well, that's a Trumpism. <laughs> uh, but uh, nevertheless, God has got a work for him to do, uh, unless he does get assassinated at some early time. Matter of fact, only a day or so ago in Texas, uh, uh, a man was arrested for planning to assassinate Trump down in Texas. So these things could happen. But um, it may be that he was just uh, allowed to be, you know, to, to live for a little bit longer to have a meeting with Netanyahu a couple of weeks after this. And they talked about a number of things which we're going to uh, talk about and make, perhaps make some assumptions on as well. But... We know that uh, he didn't get the presidency for the second time. Why? Why? Even though he'd been so supportive of Israel, and I think a lot of us expected that he would have been re-elected back in 2020. But why not? Because God wanted a weaker ruler in America. He wanted a weaker president. He wanted an an indecisive president who would take the troops out of uh, Afghanistan and that great debacle and show the world that he really had no direction or no purpose and, and, of course, we know that uh, under his rule, as opposed to uh, the time that Trump was in power, Russia found it uh, quite appropriate to invade Ukraine. Uh, or on the, on the other hand, uh, the uh, terrorist activity on October the 7th, all these things, Trump says, well, they wouldn't have happened under me. He could be right. He could be right. And we know that the current American administration has been very soft on Iran. And so Iran has uh, felt... Uh, quite uh, able to go ahead and do what they want to do with their terrorist groups, including Hezbollah, the Houthis, and, uh, uh, and uh, the people in Gaza. So, just a few days after Trump was um, shot, uh, Netanyahu went to uh, New York to address the uh, United Nations. <laughs> Anybody watch that? It was a powerful speech. Did anybody watch that? A powerful speech. And he was actually applauded 79 times. People counted it. I didn't count it, but 79 times he got rapturous applause and a standing ovation on 58 occasions in the speech that lasted less than an hour. You know, absolutely incredible. So uh, he he certainly carries the day. Uh, He is uh, very, very influential. He's a great representative of the nation of Israel. And uh, most of the American Congress, not all, uh, most of the American Congress were there and packed the place out. Uh, there in the gallery was Elon Musk at, at uh, Netanyahu's invitation, the richest man in the world. Uh, Netanyahu has connections, he has a following, uh, and he's able to achieve quite a lot for the people of Israel. That's God's plan, no doubt about that. Also there in the audience was James Packer, um, who uh, is uh, the, the Australian who lives in Israel next door to Netanyahu on the uh, seacoast here in Tel Aviv. Uh, again, uh, there are lots of connections that Netanyahu has made over the years that no other uh, Israeli leader could have done. So this is the man of the moment. And, of course, uh, Trump is very supportive. And uh, uh, whilst they didn't get on too well uh, for a little while there when uh, Netanyahu accepted that uh, Joe Biden had actually been elected president and uh, Trump didn't agree with that, uh, they're still, they, they, got on, they get on very well and they made it up if they had to make it up. When uh, Netanyahu went down to visit Trump in his compound in Florida, Mar-a-Lago, two days after he'd been addressing the Congress in New York. So they went, he, Netanyahu went down to Trump's place there, very palatial, and they had a, a two-hour meal and a discussion with some fairly heavyweight people. Uh, Trump uh, was interviewed by the media just before they sat down to have their meal together and uh, he reminded everybody that, yes, he was a strong supporter of Israel. He recognised Israel's sovereignty over the Galo Heights, um, the mountains of Israel, we might say. Uh, the, uh, uh, the embassy uh, was moved to the capital of Jerusalem, which previous presidents had suggested they would do but didn't do it. 
And uh, of course, the Abraham Accords, fantastic uh, uh, um, outcome. But then he was removed and Biden took over. But what did they talk about? What do you think they would have talked about at the dinner table? <laughs> Trump's just been assassinated. They're going to talk about assassinations. And uh, actually, Trump mentioned the fact that uh, when I was president, he mentioned to the media who were assembled there before they went into private discussion, he said, I, I during my presidency, we took out ISIS, we took out other important people. Well, they certainly did diminish the power of ISIS uh, uh, during the time uh, that Netanyahu was president. He didn't start any new wars, and that's well documented. But what did he do was he attacked the stars, so the stars fell from heaven. And that, of course, disrupted uh, the people that uh, uh, he uh, authorised assassinations or, uh, shall we say, removals. He was the head of ISIS, uh, al-Baghdadi. He was killed in uh, October 2019 when the uh, American troops closed in. This is during Trump's presidency. And he let off his own suicide bomb, suicide bomb, and that diminished the influence of ISIS, along with other activities against uh, uh, the uh, terrorist group ISIS. Also during his presidency, the uh, famous General Soleimani of Iran uh, was eliminated. Yes. Israel doesn't like to use the term assassinated, especially when it uh, relates to, to not very likable people. They're eliminated. Israel uses the same term, don't they? They're eliminated or they're neutralised. Um, so, uh, in, in early 2020, uh, the General Soleimani, who was the top uh, 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 promoter of terrorism on behalf of Iran, uh, and uh, then the head of the nuclear program uh, of Iran was assassinated. And this is the way that uh, Trump dealt with things, that was to uh, organise, uh, to take out the heads of the groups. So, as we said, the uh, Qasem Soleimani was uh, taken out in a surgical drone strike, 3rd of January 2020, and then later, on the 27th of November 2020, not long before uh, Trump, of course, left office, uh, Frank Rizzati, who was uh, the chief nuclear weapons scientist uh, on the uh, Iranian program, was actually assassinated by a satellite-controlled machine gun using artificial intelligence developed by Israel. Absolutely incredible. We'll talk about that a bit more in a moment. Now, Mohammed bin Salman, of course, is the arch enemy of Iran, or it's vice versa. And, uh, and, and Netanyahu, of course, they need to deal with Iran in some way or another. When and where do those, these two men first meet? Now, this program of, uh, that, the, the still working your way in the background of bringing together a peace agreement, uh, between Saudi Arabia and Israel, uh, has been going behind the scenes for some time. And as we said, Netanyahu speaks to the uh, United Nations, uh, MBS uh, speaks to the uh, Fox News reporter and says, we're getting very, very close to peace. And I think this is one occasion where you could almost say, well, there was a peace and safety cry, and then sudden destruction came on the 7th of October and put all that behind. In any case, I think there's probably numerous occasions or numerous applications of the peace and safety cry. This was one. Now, uh, on the 22nd of November 2020, just five days before that nuclear scientist was assassinated or eliminated, four men held a secret meeting, a clandestine meeting in the area known as Neom in, in Saudi Arabia. Crown, Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman uh, has uh, begun building a great futuristic city there in the Om, and uh, he was uh, anxious to show it off. Netanyahu got on a private plane and they met together down there. Uh, it, it's uh, The project is uh, a vanity project as far as Mohammed bin Salman is concerned, uh, and it's starting to take shape, but it's going to take a bit longer than perhaps he thought, but he sees it as a, creating a bridge between Saudi Arabia and Jordan and Egypt and possibly, if Israel comes on board, Israel as well. So this is the uh, location of Neom. And you can see the, uh, the red line there. That's the, that's the living city. Uh, that red line uh, stretching from the edge of the Gulf of Aqaba, well inland, is 170 kilometres long. 
And that's to be a city that's 170 kilometres long and only 200 metres wide from here to the street, roughly. <laughs> the idea being that uh, the uh, transport, central transport of high-speed rail will run down the middle and everybody will live either side, perhaps only in a, a few storeys high, in their residences. Not far from there will be also an industrial development, but uh, everything is meant to be uh, ultra-high-tech, um, no roads, no cars, no carbon emissions, and up to nine million people living there. So when Netanyahu went down there, there was only really an airport and a little bit of starting of construction, but there was this secret meeting. There were four people there. There was uh, from the Mossad, there was Yossi Cohen, Netanyahu, uh, Mike Pompeo representing the United States, representing Donald Trump uh, as the Secretary of State, and Bin Salman. Did they meet to okay this, the assassination just five days later? Yes, it seems that way. So Israel neutralised uh, Iran's top nuclear weapon scientists at that time, put their program back uh, years by taking out this man, uh, using a high-powered weapon fired robotically by artificial intelligence, by satellite, from over a 1,000 miles away. It's incredible. And then the AI was uh, used to fire a number of shots, you can see there into the driver's seat the left-hand side, uh, to take this fellow out. His wife sitting in the passenger seat, she wasn't harmed. Uh, you know, and this is fired from so far away. Now, Ben Salman's kind of looking at this and he's saying, I want some of that. <laughs> I want some of that artificial intelligence. I'm, I want to get involved with Israel. And uh, so it's quite, quite remarkable. Of course, the, the uh, artificial intelligence, the computer worked out the recoil from the rifle, the distance the car would have travelled at the speed it was travelling, so that the shots all went at the as the car is moving, incredible. So now we're coming to this month, this very month, August. And in August, we know that the two uh, important people in the uh, opposition to Israel uh, were taken out. The Hezbollah commander in Beirut and uh, the Hamas political chief in Tehran. And uh, so Hezbollah number two um, and uh, and uh, Hamas number one in uh, Tehran, they're taken out overnight between the 30th and the 31st of July. And now, Yaya Sinwar is in charge of Hamas with his bodyguard. <laughs> and unfortunately, that's the kind of bodyguards they have. Human shields. Children, women, human shields. Uh, he's a brutal man, this one, Sinwar, who's taken over now. Um, these are his associates. These are the people who run Gaza. I'd like to meet them on a dark night or even the daylight. <laughs> That's the kind of people that uh, uh, Israel now has to deal with. And uh, they are very, very ruthless people, no shadow of a doubt about that, running Gaza. Now, following, as we said, Trump meeting with Netanyahu at Mar-a-Lago, uh, just a few days before this, uh, those uh, two assassinations, uh, the... Uh, Obvious thing was that they talked about assassinations and how they could, uh, how uh, they can forward the program of Israel uh, as opposed to uh, a, an all out war where America uh, and Britain are cutting back on weapons supply. So is it, in, is it uh, more influential and more important that they get some of the leaders? Yes. But the truth is, Netanyahu has stepped up his game. And it, 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 it all stepped up after he came back from his visit to the United States. He has gone after high value targets, killing multiple leaders in Hezbollah and killing multiple leaders also in Hamas. But most significantly, he took out the political chief of Hamas. That's significant in itself. But most significant is he took him out in a high security zone, in a VIP yeah. guest house, in a general vicinity where government officials live. It's an impressive array of American force. Take a look at this. F-22 Raptors, F-A-18 Super Hornets, guided missile submarines and destroyers, Tomahawk, Tomahawk land attack cruise missiles, and the USS Roosevelt and Lincoln carrier strike groups will now both stay very close in in this region. So America is moving more and more assets into the Middle East. Uh, the West in general are moving more and more military assets into the Middle East. Prepare war, wake up the mighty men, let them all draw near, says Joel. 
and Australia is involved. And Australia is going to take command of the Red Sea Task Force, uh, which is intended to be protecting shipping from uh, the uh, Houthis and uh, other influences in the Red Sea from October. Now, we haven't got a boat there. <laughs> America asked Australia to send a boat, but uh, Australia said no, but we'll send some of our naval people. And um, uh, and uh, the uh, uh, situation clearly is that uh, Australia, every nation is involved. The West is becoming more and more committed. Iran and Israel are currently at a boiling point. The US and Russia have both mobilised in case of escalation, which is looking more and more likely. The U.S. is deploying more fighter jets and warships to the Middle East to help defend Israel from possible retaliatory attacks by Iran and its proxies. So Iran did attack in 2024 earlier this year in April, uh, following a couple of their uh, military commanders uh, being taken out in uh, their uh, uh, consulate in Syria. And they tried. They sent 300-odd rockets. Most of them were neutralised by the Iron Dome system. Uh, but uh, they certainly uh, uh, still are a force to be reckoned with, Iran, and uh, from the Houthis down south and from Lebanon in the north. Hezbollah, brothers and sisters and young people, is next. The Hamas situation uh, is getting towards being under control uh, in Gaza, and, of course, there are sixty to 100,000 people, uh, Jewish people, who've had to leave their homes in northern Israel because of Hezbollah's attacks and Israel's not going to let that continue on and Hezbollah uh, will be dealt with very soon. Look at the flag of Hezbollah, the party of Allah with a machine gun held aloft. Dreadful, isn't it? Terrible, terrible situation. So Hezbollah has uh, many rockets. Israel has its iron dome. Can it deal with 150,000 rockets? They've got something like 150,000 rockets. And that map on the left-hand side there gives you some arcs as to how long it takes for the rockets to get down to Israel. And if you look at the uh, arc uh, of Tel Aviv, it takes 75 seconds for a rocket to get there, fired by Hezbollah. So Israel has to deal with it, don't they? So the question is, how do we get his MBS to the table, to uh, to an agreement, to the... Join the Abraham Accords. Uh, the, uh, uh, the futuristic city he plans to build, it might quite look like that uh, picture there, but uh, that was an early indication of what it might look like. But in 20 years, the estimated population of Neon, they wanted to be 9 million people. Where will they come from? Well, I think there's an answer. The new path to prosperity, uh, and there's you know, the addressing the United Nations about the plan to uh, produce a a new transport route right through the Arabian Peninsula, uh, cutting out the Persian Gulf, the Red Sea, the Suez Canal, uh, so that the ships would land uh, uh, somewhere near Oman and unload their cargo, the uh, fast rail, right up to Haifa, that sort of area, and then on to uh, Europe. So it's a big plan, and Saudi Arabia wants to be part of that. I'll uh, leave this... uh, uh, slide, uh, the opportunity for you to look at these slides uh, with Brother Phil and uh, there'll be uh, copies available so you can have a look at that. What are the different uh, uh, um, advantages for Israel and Saudi Arabia? Saudi Arabia wants security from the US. They also want the nuclear technology, both civil and military, from Israel and America. And uh, they want uh, all sorts of water desalination and other facilities that they know they can get by an arrangement with Israel. The question is now, who is going to control the Temple Mount? It's the Al-Aqsa Flood, or it's the Operation uh, Iron Swords, uh, Swords of Steel. Who's going to control the Temple Mount? Uh, Will Hamas's Operation Al-Aqsa Flood succeed? We certainly don't think so. Uh, But uh, they're, of course, concerned about the Dome of the Rock, uh, the uh, mosque on the top of uh, the Temple Mount. Dome of the Rock was established in 688 AD and the times from Daniel chapter uh, 12, which we're going to be talking about tomorrow night by ruling at Mount Waverley, just a little advertisement for Mount Waverley tomorrow night. We'll be talking about the prophecy of Daniel. The three time periods, all beginning at 688, come to 1948, establishment of the nation of Israel, no more scattering of the people. Uh, 1978, uh, free access for all peoples to worship on the Temple Mount 
hasn't quite come about yet, and 2023, 13, 35 years, blesses he who waits what happened in 1978, the Camp David Accords. The Camp David Accords said all people must have access. They said President Sadat of Egypt to the city, enjoy free exercises of worship, the right to visit and transit in the holy places without distinction or discrimination. Huge, but it hasn't actually come about yet. Daniel chapter 12, in the last verse of Daniel, Daniel is told, Go thy way till the end be, for thou shalt rest and stand in thy lot at the end of the days. The end of the days. What does the end of the days actually mean? Is it our time? No doubt about it. As a matter of fact, in Daniel chapter 12 and verse 8, a particular word for end is used. It's not the same as, as other times, part of the end, end of the days. It's actually Daniel asking, O oh my Lord, what shall be the end of these things, the last extremity of these things, an end that really is the cutoff, the final end? And he's told, 1335 days, this is he that waits until that time, and then you will stand in your lot at the end of the days. And uh, Nebuchadnezzar is told in his vision, all this is about the end of the days. And at the end of the days for Nebuchadnezzar, he got his sanity restored. It was like a resurrection for him. And at the end of the days, we know Daniel chapter 12 says, it's the end of the world, the very end. And when Jesus uses those terms, brothers and sisters, and as I said, we'll talk about more, more about this uh, God willing tomorrow night. When you, Jesus uses the term the end of the world, it's in the context of the, uh, of the prophecy when the disciples ask him, when will be the end of the world? And the end of the world, he says earlier on in two parables, the parable of the tears and the parable of the fishing net. At the end of the world, the angels separate the just from the unjust. That's the end of the world. That's when the angels come. And he said to the disciples, do you understand what I'm talking about? They said, yea, Lord. And a few chapters later, Matthew 24, the, uh, which is the Olivet Prophecy, they asked him, when's the end of the world? And Jesus said in the last verse of Matthew chapter 28, lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the world. And I think, brothers and sisters, we are right at the end of the world.